Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, AARP Wisconsin, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Lee Snodgrass of Appleton is a Democratic candidate in the 19th Senate District. Lee, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Glad to be back. You say on your website that too many Wisconsin residents have a choice between new tires or food in, on their table. What's your point? My point is that right now Wisconsin is not working for the majority. Um, there are too many people struggling um, at the doors. You know, when I'm talking to people, there are people working several jobs. There are people giving plasma to make ends meet. There are people making difficult decisions like healthcare decisions or um, home improvements, things that might go awry, a hot water heater, new tires for a car, things like that. So I'd like to see a Wisconsin where it's working for the majority of working Wisconsinites instead of a few at the top. If you're elected, the immediate steps that you think you could take to, to make a difference in, in these issues sure. that you just outlined? Well, part of it is reducing expenses for people, and part of it is um, doing something about wages. So when we talk about reducing expenses, one of the first things that comes to mind is making sure we have health care be more affordable for more people in Wisconsin. So of course, you've heard a lot of people talking about the Medicaid expansion, right. which we certainly should have taken. It would have helped a lot more people, and it would have saved us money as Wisconsinites taxpayers. Um, also, I'd like to see us start talking about raising the minimum wage. Um, I think it's a it's a tough conversation and it's a degreed conversation and we'd have to um, figure out what the impact of that is. But that's a conversation we need to start having. Take the take the wage how high? Fee? Um, that's why we have to have that conversation. I mean, it hasn't been raised since what 1993. I mean, when I was working um, and to pay you know for school in, in 1990 and 1991, I think I was making seven eight dollars an hour. Kids are still doing that, and they're still and they're meanwhile their education costs have skyrocketed. Um, so let's start at 12, I don't know, don't quote me on things specifically, but let's get it higher, let's get it so that somebody can actually perhaps, you know, put food on the table, pay for childcare. These are things that people are struggling with right now because the, the, the compensation is so low. You mentioned healthcare. How can we protect and maybe expand healthcare uh, in rural Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I think I just read that um, one-fifth of the population lives in rural communities, but only 10% of healthcare providers are in rural communities, so that's obviously a care gap that we have. Um, I think we can do things on a state level to incentivize people to um, come and work where there is more of a demand. Um, um, we can do things like that. I also think that we could possibly look into expanding um, medical residencies in rural communities. Um, it's been proven when people do their residency in a rural community, they tend to stay there. Um, so those are things that we can do to increase that. Um, so we, I think we do need to make sure that we have um, you know, health care clinics there that are going to provide affordable health care for people. So the state has a role in recruiting and retaining doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals? You know, I think we have a role in retaining and recruiting all sorts of workers. I don't think it's going to happen by a marketing plan paid for by our government, um, our, our state government. You know, I work in marketing as a job, and um, I, I kind of, you have to have a good product to sell it. And right now, Wisconsin, um, our selling points are going downhill. Um, the longer the Republicans have been in charge, the less we have to really talk to people about why they should relocate here in Wisconsin. And I think we need to be working on those things like strong schools and affordable health care and an environment that we're protecting and enjoying. Um, and then people will want to come here. The pilot program, state government and uh, Delta Dental, Mm -hmm. where they um, provide dental care, they subsidize dental care for low income in rural areas. Yeah. Should that be a priority in the next Medicaid budget? Um, <clears throat> well, I think it should be part of it. Um, I don't know if it should be uh, prioritized, but it should certainly be a part of it. Um, you know, it's funny, I was just at the dentist a couple of weeks ago and we were having a conversation about that. Um, you know, they struggle with a couple of things. They struggle with reimbursement rate, which is extremely low for dentists. So I think we need to work on that for everybody, um, for Medicaid reimbursement rate. Um, I also think that people don't realize that dental health, um, primarily gum disease, actually impacts overall health. It's a very holistic thing. 
Um, people who have gum disease are like twice as likely to have incidents of stroke or heart attack, so obviously that costs us more. So I do think an investment in making sure that people have access to affordable, good dental health is a smart thing. Are you hearing as you campaign from caregivers, AARP says there are 578,000 Wisconsin residents who are caregivers for family members or other loved ones. Yeah. Would you support laws or regulations that call for hospitals to recognize family caregivers when their loved ones are hospitalized? I think what's happening now, now this is a story that's personal to me. My father um, is undergoing um, cancer treatment for lymphoma for like the uh, fourth time in eight years. And so mm -hmm. my mother is a caregiver like that. Um, because of his treatment, uh, what it, chemotherapy can kind of uh, interfere with your cognitive um, ability for a while. My mother is the person who has to be there at his appointments when he's discharged, has to understand the medications and the follow-up and the protocol and things like that. So a lot of hospitals are doing that on their own because they understand that um, that's just good medicine and that's just good provider care. I think doing something like AARP is talking about, I think it has been done in other states, maybe Ohio, um, and it's simply um, legislating that. It's simply making it a formality and saying, you know, this is something that we think should be done um, on a state level so that you have that continuum of care, not just if you have a community with a strong hospital system, but other places as well. So, yeah. Kimberly Clark wants the same Foxconn tax breaks, tax benefits, and has given the state Senate till the end of the month to act. Mm -hmm. Now, it's in what would be your district, 600 yes. jobs yeah. at a Kimberly Clark plant. Mm -hmm. the, you don't support the bill that the assembly passed on February 22nd, do you? Well, um, I think right now you're asking me a bit of a hypothetical um, because we've already heard that um, the bill that's in the assembly, um, if it got to the Senate, um, uh, portions of it might be vetoed. Voss talked about portions of, of might be vetoed by, by Governor Walker. Um, what I've heard is that the, the Legislative Fiscal Bureau um, doesn't even have a bill in front of them to rework the numbers to understand what a new bill might look like without the non-wovens facility, which is closing. They've confirmed that. Right. That's the um, 110 jobs. That's the 110 jobs. So right. at this point, um, I don't feel like there's enough information to go on. Um, what I am interested in is making sure that we have a strategic, sustainable um, investment in companies in Wisconsin. Um, you know, we, we are still the number one industry for uh, our state for paper making. Um, it, we employ about 30,000 people in the paper industry. Um, my area has been particularly hard hit with mills going out of business over the last few years. 1,400 jobs um, in Outagamie County related to paper. Um, I really like the paper makers fund that um, Dave Hansen and Amanda Stuck talked about. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's good because to me that's responsive to, it might not pertain to Kimberly Clark, but to me it's responsive to industry changes. Um, now I used to work in paper, so um, I do have a little bit more of an understanding than probably the average person. Um, I've given mill tours, I've consulted for paper companies um, in their marketing department, and I worked for Fox River Paper Company. So I understand some of the challenges and how the market has changed. In an e-commerce world, there's more of an investment now in those um, that brown paper, as we call it, for packaging. Right. So the Paper Makers Fund did address some of that. Um, so right now, I think what's interesting is that um, we, have, we have Senate leadership who uh, are not leading. Um, you know, we have, the, it's a case where that, that bill was up for a vote um, and it was put aside and um, there are no answers. And now, now everybody's mired in, in campaigning and, and we just don't have answers. You, would you have voted though against the Foxconn tax package? Tax breaks? I'm not a fan of the Foxconn tax package for a number of reasons. Um, one, I mean, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of vetting things, and if I had to take that company and vet that company, there would be a lot of red flags from <clears throat> historical human rights violations um, to things that they've done uh, where they've made agreements in other states that they've not followed through on and backed out on. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I, I think it was run through extremely fast with a lot of, out a lot of input, and frankly, I think that's sort of what is happening now um, with Kimberly Clark. I mean, it, it's a... It's a bill that was written and put through in 48 hours. Um, and now we have Roth going on air and pleading on television and saying that they need some Democrats to pass it. And um, they didn't need Democrats when it came time to, to write it and to uh, have solutions-based conversations. But suddenly they need Democrats to come to the table, even though they're in leadership in the governor's office and the Senate and the assembly. I don't buy it. 
The um, impasse in the capital over transportation funding, it touches the district because the governor just ordered a study yeah. of widening of 41 <laughs> when we don't know how we're going to, we don't have a long range plan to right. pay for highways. Right. How would you pay long range for highways? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's interesting to me because um, he, he called a press conference about it, um, hearing, you know, um, the county executive Tom Nelson and others talking about the, the challenges. I mean, the last thing I saw that there were 479 accidents in a year in that particular corridor, obviously a problem. Um, and then a week later, the governor was at another event and he said, no, I don't think we need to do expansion. We just need to fix what we have. So again, um, I'm a confusing message, uh, a lack of leadership in a sense. How would I pay for it? That's the question of the day. Um, I, I think that the impasse has been, you know, every single door I knock, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat or an independent, they all say fix the roads. So where people stop that conversation is how to pay for it. It right. uh, should be pretty simple. Um, and part of that is just like, let's start a conversation. What does indexing the gas tax mean? What are the impacts of that? What is adding a, a modest fee to uh, registration? Um, what, what's, it, what's the impact of that? Um, I know tolling is tossed about. I think that's a far more complicated, but let's have a conversation about it before we, we rule it out. Um, and I do think that we need to always remember that part of any long-term uh, infrastructure uh, conversation should include looking at public transportation. I mean, do you remember 2010 when the governor said no to federal funds that would have had a high-speed rail? What would that have done to our roads? What, have, what would that have done to Foxconn? I mean, w maybe we wouldn't have had to offer them so much if there was a great high-speed rail getting pe you know, workers down to that part of the state. Um, so I think that we need to look at a really big, comprehensive, holistic picture when it comes to roads, but I don't think we can wait anymore. Local governments have been dealing with levy limits for 14 years. Yeah. Some local <coughs> leaders say it hurts their ability to provide services. Keep levy limits to protect property taxes, loosen them, get rid of them. I have a lot of friends in um, county government and city council, um, and I am a huge fan of local control. Um, you know, most local governments are, are very fiscally conservative, and they're used to making sure that they're making the best use of taxpayer dollars. Um, I personally would lean towards getting rid of them and letting local governments decide um, because it does impact schools and impacts the services that we provide. Um, um, so many things really. I mean if you ask people to name what your uh, property taxes pay for versus what your state sales tax pay for, people are far more likely to rattle off what they know that their property tax dollars are going for. State's a little bit more nebulous. So I think and the great thing is, if people don't like what a local um, municipality has done with their property taxes, that's a two-year term. You can, you can vote them out. If you don't like what they're doing, vote them out. I don't think it's the state's business to do that, but I will say this. Um, if the conversation to start is about easing it back, then let's have that conversation. Because part of the problem that we've had in Madison now is the, you know, here's people on this side, here's people on this side, and nobody's coming together to have a conversation about a compromise. And if easing them back is the first compromise, I'm okay with that. The current state budget had a uh, significant increase in state aid for K-12 schools. Mm -hmm. Do we need a similar large increase in the next state budget? If so, why? Well, uh, the education governor, and I say that with a smile on my face because I don't see uh, that as being an accurate um, uh, modicum, um, uh, moniker. The governor has still, he has put money back in the budget, but it has still not what it was in 2010, 2011. Um, meanwhile, increasing, um, increasingly schools have additional challenges. Um, so I definitely think we need to take a look at that funding formula. We need to start looking at a formula that's perhaps related to meeting individual student need. Another thing that people forget is that this is part of Wisconsin's constitution, um, is guaranteeing you know, good, strong public education that has sort of a, um, an evenness no matter where it is, whether you're in a rural community or in an urban community. Um, and a lot of the problems are caused by, you know, funding a separate school system, the voucher school system, which I would put a moratorium, moratorium on right away. Okay. Yeah. Uh, your website calls for changes in social justice. Can you be more precise? What are you talking about there? Um, I'm talking about um, our prison reform system. Um, I, think, I think reform right now is what's missing. Um, we're incarcerating and we're not making an investment in making sure that we're reducing recidivism and we're taking a look at why some of these people end up there. You know, a lot of these people are ending up there because of mental health issues or addiction issues and we really need to start there. We're talking about, you know, 
Um, I just read an article about Tommy Thompson. He has a, a book coming out, and one of the things that he regrets most was basically expanding our prison population. Um, and, and so he is taking ownership for his part in the so-called need for a new prison that you hear a lot of Republicans talking about. Um, I think the place to start is to say, you know, what, what's going on with parole? What's, what's, what's going on with, um, you know, letting people get out? And um, part of it is when they get out, there's nobody there to help them get a job, under, you, know, you know, get back into society, get, get in touch with support services that might have been provided in prison if they were lucky. Um, and we need to do that because I have a friend who works at a, um, um, a health care system for the nurse, uh, or excuse me, for the prison in Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. And he said to me that patients tell him, it's easier for me to be here than it is for me to be out there. I've been out, it's just easier for me to just do something to get back here. And that's not right. Time to legalize recreational and medical marijuana? Definitely medical. Um, again, personal story with my dad. Um, I go with him to the infusion lab um, you know, each, each, every six weeks when he has his treatment. And there are people there who I've had open conversations with about wanting that symptom relief um, so that they have an appetite again. Um, so let's start there. I, I'm very open to the conversation about recreational, but I also like the idea of seeing where all these referendums go. Uh, Brown County has a referendum coming up. Out of Gamies did not make it. Uh, I'm understanding it's not probably going to make it to the, to the ballot in November, but I think other communities will be doing that. Um, I think you're going to see a, a, a change in people's attitudes, and I think that's worth exploring because I think you know, when you legislate something, you can regulate it and you can tax it, and we can certainly use that money. Uh, dark star loophole is an issue in your campaign. Yes. Uh, what's your position? My position is that there was the ability to close that loophole last session, and um, my opponent literally prevented that from getting to the floor for a vote, um, and now he's campaigning on it. Yes, he is. Um, so he is, and I watched your Wisconsin I um, interview on it. He is talking about doing the right thing and the fair thing, and um, the time for that was last session. Um, so certainly I would work to close that loophole. Um, and I, I think that um, assuming that Wisconsinites, as they begin to understand the issue more, that they're going to have some sort of general amnesia and forget that there was that opportunity and Senate leadership did nothing about it, uh, is certainly something I'm going to keep talking about. Any other differences with uh, the Republican you're challenging you want to highlight? Um, I, I always like to use the three P's for that, um, personality, policy, and presence. Um, obviously, um, I'm a pretty straightforward person. I'm going to tell it like it is. I am going to be somebody who you know where I stand on an issue, even if we don't agree. Um, and I think people respect that and need that in government right now. Um, policy, obviously our priorities are different. You know, I am prioritizing the working class family. I am one of these people. I know what it's like to struggle a little bit, and I want to make sure that I'm working on prioritizing things that make a healthy community, like strong education, access to affordable health care, good paying jobs, union jobs. Um, and then a presence, that's an important one for me. I have been a resident of, of this district for 24 years. I work. I raised a family, I recreate, and I am among everybody, and I'm talking to business owners and uh, uh, farmers at the farmer's market and um, festivals and things with my children, and those conversations help me know what my district needs. I don't see my opponent doing that. Democrat Lee Snodgrass of Appleton is a Democratic candidate in the 19th Senate District. The election is November 6th. Lee, thanks for talking to Wisconsin. Thank I. you so much. Thank you. Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, AARP Wisconsin, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel.